Good evening and welcome to the March 9, 2015 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the pledge? Karen, could you please take the roll? Ms. Oglis? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. Mazur? Here. Mr. DuPont? Mr. Wood? Here. Thank you, and please note that in the absence of Mr. DuPont and Mr. Bealey, uh, Ms. Oglis will be a voting member this evening. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Next item is... Oh, oh, never mind. Oh, we can't shut that door. Leave it open a crack, right? No. Can't. No, I'll, to, I'll do it. Can't. Thanks. Next item is the approval of minutes from the February 17, 2015 meeting. Move approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. The second. Is there any discussion? Maybe I'll wait for Ms. Oglis to return. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Someone go rogue out there. Uh, right. So, Susan, we have a second motion on the table for approval of the minutes okay. from the last meeting. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Show the deem unanimous. Thank you. A couple of uh, housekeeping notes on the agenda. Items number five and six uh, have both been tabled at the request of the applicant. Item number five was uh, Cloverleaf Estates Subdivision Amendment Review. And item number six was uh, Robert McLaughlin requesting relocation of a non-conforming structure within the Shoreland Zone. Again, those have both been tabled. So if there's anyone here for those items, they will not be uh, taken up this evening. Uh, the next item on our agenda, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on amendments to the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance 405. The proposed amendments to the Zoning Ordinance would establish a local list of historic buildings and properties and zoning incentives and building code exceptions that can help enable the preservation of these buildings. Mr. Bacon? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this, as, as titled, um, these zoning amendments uh, establish a local list of historically significant properties um, and then also come up with some um, encouragements and incentives for historic preservation of those properties. Um, the town established an ad hoc preservation committee, historic preservation committee, I think about two years ago, and the committee's been working diligently for uh, since that time, researching, um, crafting, and analyzing what properties um, should be on a local historic list uh, recognized here in Scarborough. So uh, these zoning amendments include that historic list. There's about 48 properties. They used a, a range of criteria. Uh, in selecting these properties um, based on the age of the buildings, the historical significance of the building design and architecture, um, historical significance of people or events that were associated with the properties, etc. And they, they took a historic inventory of um, maybe close to 2,000 properties conducted in the mid-90s and, and whittled it down to, to this list. So this zoning amendment establishes this list um, and it also establishes some um, benefits or incentives that these properties can um, garner from the zoning ordinance. Um, if the, the list is not intended to be um, establishing a historic district where property owners have to keep the building, um, and so it's not a sort of de design review structured ordinance, but rather uh, incentivizing historic preservation. And so the the two main ways to incentivize or encourage historic preservation in the proposed uh, ordinance amendments are, uh, one, to establish a residential density credit for the preservation of an historic building and, and what that means and how that's proposed in the ordinance is that, say there's um, an historic building recognized on the list and has some other development potential. Typically, if, if that building was um, became a, a building lot, then that would count against how many additional lots could go within a development. 
So this, this credit actually um, excludes or holds harmless the preservation of that historic building so that uh, a development include uh, just as many lots as could go in if, say, that uh, that building wasn't preserved. So the proposal is to prevent sort of the temptation or incentive to remove a historic building um, by creating a credit for it if that building is preserved. Um, so that's one incentive uh, that we, that the historic committee hopes would be used in the future if this is established. Uh, the other is um, it provides for some exceptions for building and, and fire codes. Um, in a number of different building codes and fire codes, if there is um, recognized historic properties, um, like locally recognized state or federally recognized properties, um, they're eligible to be ex excluded from some modern building code requirements. Um, and those exclusions often include the, the size of doors or the size of windows or some other um, code requirements that, that could kind of erode the historical character of a building and, and make it no longer historical. Also, could the exceptions could make it easier for a property owner to redevelop a property so that they don't have to bring the building entirely up to new codes. Um, so that's proposed in this uh, zoning ordinance amendment. So that's really the kind of the key features of the proposal is to establish the list and to establish those, um, those two incentives to encourage historic preservation in a, in a voluntary way, not in, not in a mandated way. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> With that, before we uh, take up board discussion of this, I will uh, open a public hearing for any comments on these proposed amendments. Just ask you if you'd limit your comments to five minutes and try not to repeat anything that's already been stated. And if you would, just please come up to the podium and provide your name and address and for the record and hear what you have to say. My name is Brenda Harrison. And I'm assuming this is from my grandmother's property. I'm not sure. Um, it came to my house at 191 Spurwink Road, but it's under the Stamford Family Trust. For I think the house was built in 1716 around. I think it doesn't tell me what property you're looking at. Um, 194. 194. Is 194. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Then that's. Uh, um, I really don't know what questions are. I just want to know what this uh, this land, what we have left is for my mother and her, she's 91. So what does this do if we want to sell the property? What, what if we want to keep, I mean, I don't really like to see the house torn down. It's, it's built in 1716 and everything. But if, if we sign on to something like this, what does that do for the future sale or how does that work? Well, what we typically do with the hearings is we'll we'll take note of all the comments and then we'll mm -hmm. address we'll address those when that, through the board. Yeah. So thank you very much. That, that's very neat. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once. Mm. Going twice. I will close the public hearing. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have the question from Ms. Harrison about what this means for future sales, and I, Dan, you can certainly elaborate on this, but my general understanding is that this, this really is meant to be um, kind of a carrot-based approach, if you will, not something that's restrictive or that would uh, presumably uh, put a damper on property values or ability to, to do anything that, with the property that you might otherwise do, but that... Uh, there are opportunities here for owners in the form of these incentives if someone wanted to take advantage of them uh, that could allow them to do more than they would otherwise be able to do. Is that yeah, that's, an accurate way of putting that's it? That's the intent, is to create um, encouragement for, say, the buyer, if you were selling, um, to, to not want to tear the building down, but, but rather to invest in it and um, preserve it as historic. And the, the two carrots as um, Mr. Fellows highlighted were one is that 
potentially if there's additional subdividable land that goes along with this property, um, the property could get an extra development lot if, if this lot was preserved. That's the idea where you don't get, um, you don't have to count the property that includes an historic building towards the overall amount of development that could occur. So it's an incentive uh, to preserve the building in exchange for maybe gaining an addi additional building lot in, in this case. The other incentive is that um, if the building's preserved, then they could take advantage of some building code and fire code <coughs> flexibilities so that if, it's, if there's a major renovation, you may not need to change various features out that uh, are accepted in the building code for historic recognized historic properties. Right, and I, and I think a, along those lines, the, I think the key distinction is that we're not talking about what el, the types of things that people often associate with historic districts where every time you want to think about doing an addition or making any kind of modification to your property, you have to go before a historic commission to get approval. It's, it's not along those lines. So. Mr. Wood? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think to be fair to uh, all of us and Ms. Harris in particular, I, and I might be reading this wrong, there, there would be a requirement, it appears, of the developer or the individual that wishes to develop a lot that has a listed historic property on it. If it can't be saved or all, you know, it must be altered or manipulated in any way, shape, or form, they have to provide a narrative or, you know, engage themselves in a discussion as to why they can't do that why they can't preserve it. Right. So, you know, there is a little bit of a threshold in that case. Um, so, you know, you're wise to ask that question. And I'm all, you know, I, I'm going to support this ordinance, but it's not all carrot. There, there is a little bit of a threshold as a developer must prove to the town that uh, it doesn't make uh, sense under, I don't know what criteria, financially or whatever, to keep whatever structure, whatever historic value might be on that property. Um, Am I misunderstanding no, that? There's existing language in the ordinance that <coughs> that requires that now adding this list subjects you to that. That's true. Um, but that's a, that is a step that happens if it's a project that goes in front of the planning board. Mm -hmm. um, so it wouldn't necessarily happen if they're just acquiring the property. Um, be it, but if the planning board is looking at a development, there needs to be evidence that they explored keeping the, the building before it's decided that it's removed. It doesn't require you to keep it, but there's a step that needs to occur. And go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Just to finish up. But, um, again, I, I'm going to support this initiative, certainly, but um, I'm curious as to um, is there a – do you know offhand – the different types of uh, measures that are taken to identify a particular property. It talks about um, the town council might meet from time to time. Um, I'm particularly interested in if a individual, either a owner or a citizen or whatnot, might, you know, want to initiate a conversation about a particular property and want it to be characterized as historic. To add it to the yeah. list? That's the question. Right. That was. <clears throat> Yeah, that was um, because this committee that established the list is ad hoc, so they're, no, they're not a permanent committee. The committee may not stay in existence. Um, the, the committee and the council and staff wanted there to be a process to continue to grow the list if there's properties that the committee missed or if the council wants a, a larger list. Um, so there isn't a formula, per se, as to how that's going to occur, but perhaps the council would form another historic preservation committee to okay. kind of consider um, adding or subtracting from the list should they get a number of requests. Could I, to that question? Sure. Um, that was my only real concern with this as well, but I would like to suggest that it has to be, a, something has to be a little more formed than that, like perhaps saying once a year the council needs to I'm making this up, appoint an ad hoc committee, reform the ad hoc committee, turn it over to another existing committee, whatever. But once a year, it needs to be opened up to the addition of additional properties. And that could, it could be have kind of some kind of definition. I don't think it's important. But it's just that, you know, I can think of three or four places that would be really nice to see on this list. So where would I take it as a resident? 
So I think something like that needs to be built into the system, what you do when you want to do something in the future with the ordinance. Okay. Good. <coughs> well, let, me, let me begin by saying in, that in the big picture, I'm in favor of having some sort of historical uh, list. But I have some <coughs> concerns, too. One, let's take a piece of property in which there is a building, and I'll use you as an example if you don't mind. And it's one building, and they want to knock it down. You know, can they do that? Uh, I, your question was well stated, but can they do that? There, there are no incentives. There, there's nothing for subdivision. There's nothing. There's a building. I own it. I want to knock it down. Can they do that without any repercussions is my question. Under this proposal, if they're not going forward with site plan review or subdivision review, a review process that goes to the planning board, um, there's no prohibition on removing a building on this list. There, there okay. isn't like some towns have a demolition delay ordinance where um, there's some type of time frame that you have to say that you have to declare that you're going to demolish a building and there's a time frame for you know trying to work out a deal for historic preservation or some type of review this isn't proposing um, that type of process okay and, and, and the reason why I ask that and, and I also agree with you I'd like to see more of a specific what are the criteria to put a building on the list uh, as opposed to just some general areas uh, because uh, in, in light of what Susan was saying, you know, and, and rightfully so, anybody can go and say, I want that on. Oh, I want that on. Oh, I want that on. And I think it has to be really specified as to what goes on the list. And, and my concern, so that everybody <coughs> understands, is the big city to the south of us has a historic committee that is totally dictatorial. There's no appeal process. People that own their own buildings can't can't do anything without that historic society it has more authority than the city, city council. And I just don't want to see that happen in this town. Um, again, and I'm in agreement with the whole idea of having buildings preserved in the big picture. Uh, so that that's my concern as, as far. In fact, that committee, excuse me, can come out of the woodwork. There were two major projects in Portland going on now. And at the last minute, very last minute, the Historic Society says, okay, we're going to appoint those buildings today after the sale of the property as historic buildings. And I just don't want to see that happening here. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I think my concerns are right along the lines of Ron here where um, I'm not quite clear. I mean, I have, a, I have an idea of how some of these properties ended up on the list, but I'm not clear as to the process of where the homeowners consulted. If I owned a property and then some way, somebody came to my door and said, well, guess what, you're now historically preserved building. Well, you're changing the rules of my property rights kind of midway through the game on me. And I think um, I'd want to be conscientious of a, a property owner's rights, you know, whether it be through some sort of mechanism where, you know, it ends up on a list once the, the house transfers hands. I'm not I'm just kind of off the top of my head here, but I don't like the idea of changing the rules um, in the middle of somebody's ownership uh, as to um, what they could or could not do. Overall, I agree with some of these, you know, some of these concepts we're putting out here, like, you know, getting the code exceptions for fire and building. I mean, that makes perfect sense as somebody that's worked in several old houses fixing them. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a great thing for <coughs> the owner of an old home, <laughs> is not having to bring some of these items up the code. Um, the you know the density credit for historic preservation no problems there i i think what it really drives down to for me is um i want to watch out for the property owners rights here and making sure that they are they were very much a part of this process and maybe i'm i'm off basis here maybe they were involved during these discussions i just don't know enough of that background to feel comfortable saying i'm ready to change the rules on them right now that's that's where i would be coming from on this but Otherwise, I think the, the proposals are sound. It's, it's how they got to the, the list is, I think, my, my, my major concern. 
Thanks. Susan, do you have anything more? Um, <clears throat> I don't have any problems with the way this is written. I, in my own personal opinion, it's not strong enough because I would like to have more to be said about you know what what can and actually can't be done under certain circumstances. But <clears throat> that's not what this is doing. And I understand what it is doing, and I support it. Um, I think that it, we're starting with trying to incentivize people who are purchasing the property and what the future uh, impact is going to be on that property. It's not making anyone do anything, really. <clears throat> but it's incentivizing, and it's a good place to start. We've done nothing like this before. The only suggestion I have is that there does need to be some sort of a mechanism built in that helps people, such as a citizen, say, oh, but I've always loved that building. I know how historic it is. I'm a Libby. It's a Libby. It goes back forever. What do I do with that information? Who can I go to? And there might be some criteria needed for how you get put on that list. Other than that, I think it's a job well done, and I hope that we can do more um, comprehensive work in the future about this. Thank you. I can comment on some past process. Um, the his the Historic Preservation Committee um, did work for uh, months, if not years, on kind of researching, whittling down the list. Yep. Um, and then in the fall, they attempted to contact all the property owners um, at the time. I think they contacted most of them. Some of them, I think, you know, the ownership <coughs> was questionable. And then in terms of, you know, who may have received the letter, sometimes um, notifications go to heirs versus current owners, that type of thing. So we did get a few letters back from folks that maybe didn't receive it, but I think the majority of property owners were notified. There was a meeting that was, I'd say, lightly attended. Um, and then it was proposed to move forward to the council, and then we notified folks for, for this meeting. Um, so there was a couple of opportunities I'm to not, reach out. I'm not talking about having gone into creating this. I'm talking about future expansion of it. I think, but I think um, we're speaking more to Nick's. Oh, I'm terrible. Nick was sorry. questioning the my, one my more information apology. on the process. So I really misunderstood that. You can also that. send out notifications for the next steps, just for the benefit of the public. The next steps after this meeting are the council conducts a public hearing on this proposal. So were all these people listed on this list here invited to the meeting tonight, which contained the public hearing? Did they all receive notice of, of, of this in one form or another? Yeah. All but two or three. Yeah. There was a few that came back out That's of right. 48. So okay. I'm going to say 44 to 45 weren't returned to the sender. That's, that's um, more comforting than my initial <laughs> Right. Coming. And in the fall, we did a similar mailing, and I think we got more back, maybe 8 to 10. So um, there has been outreach, and there's still steps in the process. Um, there's going to be a council public hearing and a council second reading to consider this proposal. So um, the committee has been trying to, to, to conduct outreach, and there's uh, more input folks can provide. Um, so if that helps, it's going to clarify the chronology. That's very helpful. Thank you. So <coughs> I think it's pretty clear that there's generally support on the board collectively for this with some couple of key qualifications uh, with which I agree, uh, notably uh, ensuring that there's a, that there's a, there's a clear uh, mechanism for considering uh, properties for the list and that there are clearly defined thresholds for that as much as is is feasible, um, and I do appreciate the uh, additional background on the process for how this initial list was was formulated. Um, as has been noted, uh, this sort of notification requirement that's built in would only apply to an owner who would otherwise already be going in front of the planning board and going through our standard site plan review process for which it's something that is often kind of a boilerplate thing for most of the things we see. It's almost a check the box thing where the applicant needs to indicate that they've that there's been some due diligence on whether or not there's any historical significance. So I think we're talking about something along those lines and not something that's a um, necessarily rises to a heavy burden of proof. And again, as was explained, if it's just a a, a simple building demolition, then there's really nothing that's added here. Um, but I, I think uh, I generally agree with my fellow board members that with those caveats that were mentioned, um, 
this board supports this, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, the next steps from the council, and we'll trust that there will continue to be good outreach and transparency, and look forward to seeing how it evolves. And anyone with any additional questions or comments should obviously feel free to reach out to, to uh, planning staff of town hall in general, and I'm sure they'll be happy to, to talk with you. All right. So moving on to the next item on our agenda, and again, as noted previously, items number five and six were tabled at the request of the respective applicants. Item number seven, Maine Life Care Retirement Community requests a sketch plan review for proposed changes to the contract zone of Piper Shores Retirement Community Development. Stan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Piper Shores facility, I think, is most of the or all the board knows, um, is enabled by a contract zone. It's a, it's its own zone, um, which allows this facility actually in the in the rural zone in Scarborough. And so they're going through the amendment process to add additional assisted living and memory care units to this contract zone. Um, they started their process back in the fall with a workshop with uh, the council and, and the planning board. Um, and they've since gotten first reading from the town council on the proposed amendment to their contract zone. So now they're before um, for you for a sketch plan um, to get some additional feedback as they prepare for their preliminary review and, and your public hearing coming up. Um, the contract zone process requires um, between council actions that the planning board has a public hearing and issues a preliminary approval of the proposed changes to their site plan before the council actually has an additional public hearing and, and acts on the second reading for the contract zone amendment. So we're kind of midstream through the contract zone amendment process. Um, and so probably at your next or, or later meetings, you'll have that preliminary review. Um, so again, this is a sketch plan. Um, encourage the board to look at kind of the building design and building standards to see how the addition kind of conforms to the existing assisted living facility and, and campus there. Um, we encourage the applicant to kind of coordinate with the plenty, excuse me, the fire department um, before that next preliminary submission to kind of begin their work on uh, fire department details, um, and in the staff comments, there's a, a note to continue to look at kind of parking demands and how they're going to be satisfied on the site given um, the proposal is going to extend over existing parking and uh, just make sure that there's adequate uh, parking at this facility. So, with that kind of outline on the process, so I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dan. And one more note on, on our process here this is sketch plan review. Um, we won't have public comment on this item tonight, but when this comes back to us next time, uh, when it's a little bit, a little bit more fleshed out, we will have the opportunity for public comment at that time. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Thanks very much. Good evening. My name is Mike Tatama Wieland. I'm a civil engineer with FST in South Portland. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm here with Jim Adamovich and Larry Doloff from Piper Shores. Uh, and uh, as as Dan mentioned, we're uh, we're here to look at some proposed changes to the to the existing site that I'm sure everyone's uh, at least aware of and, and probably pretty familiar with uh, at this point. Uh, Piper Shores today includes 160 independent living apartments, 40 skilled nursing rooms, 20 <coughs> assisted living apartments, and 40 independent living cottages. They're located in two portions of the site. Uh, the, the area of the site we're looking at today is referred to as the congregate area. It's where the independent living apartments and the assisted living and, and, uh, and nursing care facilities are located. Uh, Piper Shores is proposing to create 30 additional assisted living apartments, and that includes 14 memory care units. And they want to do that with an expansion of the existing Holbrook uh, healthcare facility, which is located here in this sort of light yellow color. So the, the expansion will be approximately 21,000 square feet. It's this darker orange color. Uh, it'll be a three-story structure similar to the existing. Uh, the, the, the architectural design, as Dan mentioned, is, is currently in the works, but certainly the intent will be to sort of blend and, and match with 
is the existing architecture out there. Uh, like I mentioned, it's going to be three stories. The first, or the ground floor, will have parking similar to the to the existing building, uh, and the second and third stories is where the uh, assisted living apartments will be. Uh, in, so, in addition to the the uh, the expansion of the Holbrook facility, Pepper Shores also would like to construct an arts building on site, and right now that's targeted uh, sort of on the other side of Piper Road, just south of the existing um, retention pond. It'll be about a 3,000 square foot structure, single story, uh, and it'll be to benefit the existing residents and the, the art community that, that currently exists at Piper Shores. Uh, so changes to the site plan, uh, infrastructure-wise, the, the additions will be served by existing on-site utilities. Uh, stormwater will be handled by uh, modifications to the existing stormwater uh, wet pond located across um, Piper Road. The proposal includes a new site access driveway off Piper Road. This will allow service vehicles as well as others to, to sort of traverse the site uh, counterclockwise without driving under the new building. Uh, there will also be a, a reconfiguration of the existing propane tank, which is located in this area just north of the, the new access drive. So it, we're currently looking at uh, perhaps reconfiguring the delivery access or potentially relocating the tank, and, and we'll have obviously a, a more fleshed out uh, design for that when we come back with our uh, full site plan application. Uh, <clears throat> there will be a, a parking expansion, sort of the existing parking is, is located in this area and the parking will just be sort of expanded in, in the same configuration towards the, the southwest. Uh, the reconfiguration of the existing lot with the, with the new access drive and with the building being constructed over existing parking will result in a loss of some parking. So really the intent here is to replace those uh, those spaces that are going to be lost to, to the reconfiguration of the existing lot. Um, I will mention that of the of the additional uh, assisted living units, those residents won't have vehicles. So parking, there will be a, an increased parking demand, but it, it'll be it'll be minimal. And and we again, we'll we we intend to provide additional information on sort of existing parking, the parking demands, and uh, an exact number of spaces proposed with the. The, uh, the site plan proposal when we come back to you with a, with a full application. Uh, the loading dock and compactor is currently located under the existing facility, right, right sort of in front of the main entrance to the facility. And, and it's been sort of a goal of Piper Shores to, to move that um, for years now, and they're taking the opportunity uh, to do that with this project. And, and so right now it's being targeted to move that loading dock and compactor to the south, to the end, end of that southern wing of the existing Holbrook facility. It's going to be easier to access for vehicles, we believe, as, as well as it'll be sort of less of an eyesore to the existing uh, facility for people coming in and out of this entrance. And sort of the, the other big change here is there currently some community gardens located in this area where the, the parking expansion is, is proposed. Those will be relocated. Right now we're, we're showing those on the sketch plan to be relocated sort of in, in this central uh, community area of the site. We're going through a process with the, the gardeners on site um, to, to identify the best place for it and to identify sort of a, a design to to work through a design of that, whether or not it's it's here or perhaps somewhere else in, in proximity to the to the congregate care area, um, we'll work that out prior to coming back with a with a site plan application. Uh, so I think I've covered most of the the highlights of the proposed plan. We're, we're here looking for feedback, really, so we can we can come with a more complete application uh, in the future and and perhaps understand what, what your interests are going to be when, when you review that application. So I'm happy to answer questions, and, and Jim and Larry are, 
are here to answer questions as well. Thanks. Thank you. Susan, you want to start? Sure. Um, basically, I don't have any major serious problems with this. Um, most of it, I think, will be questions that should come back to, <coughs> to us with a more formal um, request. I did go down and nosed around, and boy, you don't have much parking. <laughs> I see what you're going to be doing, but to increase the parking, <coughs> am I right in saying that as I look at what you're showing here, the light green is not wetlands? Correct. Th there will so there will be no wetland impact. No wetland impact by doing with, this? With this proposal. Okay. Um, so when you say three stories, the parking <coughs> level is considered a story. Correct. So it'll have the same number of stories above as the present building does. Correct. Okay. Which just takes me to the design standards part of this. Um, we've established what the design of these buildings are. We're just going to make sure that they continue to harmonize with each other as you come back. Sure. Um, I'm still worried about parking. You know, you said we're going to be adding some parking, but not a whole lot. But it is something that, you know, as things happen there and you need more and additional parking, long-range view of how, you know, figures, numbers, how many of actual parking spaces will not be um, eaten up by the uh, addition. Long-range planning. I have a hard time with um, distances, so I... Looking at the space that you've allocated for the arts building, it looks very, very tiny. There's, like, there's not much room in there at all before you're going to be right on top of the, the um, yeah, sure, mm -hmm, the wet pond. So, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be fine, but I'm looking forward to more complete um, sketch so I can see. Um, I guess I don't have a whole lot of anything else to be concerned about. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that this is strictly for the part of the request that the Piper Shores originally made for the expansion of the center itself. I'm not looking at anything else but that here. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Nick? Yeah, I think um, I kind of echo what Susan said already. Um, <coughs> uh, Parking spaces, I think that's going to be of interest. I know you've mentioned it, but um, you can see some expansion. But as you said, you know, a larger facility equals uh, more use, more spaces, I imagine. And um, regardless of whether or not the people that will be living there have vehicles, people visiting them may. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, can I ask what the, um, commu the where the proposed community gardens are now? What is currently <coughs> there? Is it just grass uh, that where you're proposing to put it in the center there? What's there now? Oh, uh, today it's <coughs> it's landscapes. There are some sidewalks. There there's some hardscape out there, and uh, it's sort of yeah benches and sort of a community area. Um, it's, it, and as part of the design, um, we'd be looking to sort of integrate the the gardens with perhaps some of those existing amenities out there to turn it into more of a shared space. Okay. But again, we're we're working with the the gardeners. Uh, gardening residents to uh, to work through that. Can you just um, with the arts facility? Uh, how how do you? I mean, do most of your residents tend to walk there from from their living? I mean, is that common? I mean, I see you have other out buildings, so it's a very common practice to to have them walking. With I was wondering um, whether or not park more parking would actually be needed nearby. If that was also sometimes. If people took a car there, <laughs> right? <coughs> yeah. I, so the location, it, it, it is intended that residents will walk there, and, mm -hmm. and proximity to the to the existing facilities is a big reason why we why we located it uh, where we did. Um, I wouldn't see uh, a, a situation of someone, a resident, driving there. There there are these there are spaces sort of directly adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. Um, that could be used for someone coming from off-site that, that would but you believe exit that the building. The parking there is sufficient to service the new building is what I'm asking, really. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that yeah. and okay. and, uh, and come back to you and um, and then comment on that. Am I clear on the second driveway in there over your proposed addition? Um, I guess it's your current uh, pet drive through. Right here? Yes. Yeah. That will be remaining, correct? It'll remain. It's, uh, 
you'll be able to drive under the building. So, so you'll be able to drive under here and either access um, sort of this bay of parking or continue down here. Okay. And then I guess, um, as Susan pointed out, uh, distance on these things is sometimes tricky. It looks like you have, you know, if it's one inch is 25 feet, it looks like there are probably plenty and plenty and plenty of room. But I did note that you have an entry drop-off space that looks, on this plan, eerily close to where people would be turning in. Um, but I'm sure that's probably 300 feet. But you know, just, to, just right. to keep an eye on, you know, stacking or just traffic movement through there. I'm sure. Be yeah, agreed. And that the con the concept plan you see in front of you is a little different than than the one um, that shows that the okay. drop off, and, and that's something else we're we're working through right now. Okay. But uh, uh, your point is well taken. Outside of that, um, I think this is. Uh, considering what we had first seen for a request, this is um, a much better proposal, I think, um, and probably be more welcomed by the, the community at large. So, good job. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Huh? Yeah, I'm a little bit confused, but that's nothing new. Um, we have a letter here from uh, a couple of people that said that the secondary proposal to expand and into what was given as conservation land. Yet your proposal says you're not getting into any of the conservancy, which is correct. Yeah, so th we've held workshops. Uh, we held a workshop with the board and the council last year. I was there. Yeah, and we held a, a public meeting where we looked at sort of long-term expansion of uh, the 138-acre the Piper Shores campus, and that included a concept for uh, assisted living uh, apartments within the conservation area. This this proposal does not include that. This is the the development that's going to take place here will take place almost entirely within existing developed area. Essentially, it's a building expansion over existing parking. So there is no uh, there'll be no impact to wetlands or to the existing okay. conservation easement. And that was my uh, you know that was the way I read it until I saw that this was still dated February 27th of this year. So have they been informed uh, that yeah, they, have. they have been? Thank you, Susan. The other thing is what you just mentioned uh, was uh, on 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 the DEP. And again, in, in in the narrative here, it says the project also requires an amendment to the site's existing main department of DEP. Does it or doesn't it? It does. It does. Correct. In what way? If you so it'll require an amendment. Almost anything. Uh, it, there's, so there's an existing permit. So anytime you you sort of similar to site plan amendments, anytime you you make a change, uh, particularly to, to with redevelopment um, such as this, it, it'll require an amendment. So we'll have to look at um, uh, any of the findings of fact that are changing on, on the existing permit. We'll have to address with DEP. And we so we've met with them. We've held a preliminary meeting, sort of a pre-application meeting with them, and sort of discuss the standards, and we're, we're working on that application right now. Okay, and, and following up uh, to that meeting that we had last year, I was approached afterwards by a couple of abutters who had no idea that this was even on the table, any of the concept. Uh, has there been any discussion by with the abutters of the new plan of staying, say, within uh, within the existing confines to alleviate any concerns that they may have? Yeah, we held a, a what I'll call a neighborhood meeting um, <clears throat> back towards the end of last year, and presented uh, sort of both the long-term vision that that included the potential for going into the conservation easement. But at, at that meeting, we we informed everyone that the the proposal we were going to bring forward m more immediately, which is what we're here for, would would only include uh, what's shown here. Okay, and, and following up on what my fellow board members as, as an additional thing, uh, again, I want to make sure the flow of all this is to everybody's benefit. Uh, the residents, any visitors, any vendors that go in there, that we we we, we make sure that it's uh, safe and and you know conducive. And the only other thing is, um, I've learned they've taught me on this committee. Yeah, you use the word modest increase as far as impervious area. I'd like a more specific what what modest increase means as opposed to just a generic term. 
Sure. Yeah, I, I don't have that number uh, uh, for okay, you today. Uh, that, that'll certainly be in in our future submission. But I can tell you, really, the increase is is going to be associated with this parking lot here. That's e almost everything else is is redevelopment of existing impervious areas. Like for instance, this building will be there's existing parking under this under where the new building is today, and this parking exists today. So it'll it'll be it'll really be for the most part, this parking area. So we're talking 20 spaces, 20 parking spaces or so. On a personal basis, I appreciate the fact that you went back to the drawing board after our first meeting and uh, and decided to come up with a plan like this, and I'll just be kind of anxious, as, as you've heard, I won't repeat, you know, as far as design standard and so forth, but as far as the proposal itself is concerned, other than what I just expressed to you, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Thank Thanks, Ron. Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you're probably aware of the history that Viper Shores had, you know, uh, I don't know how many years ago now, maybe 12, 14, so. So uh, my role on the planning board is a little bit different than the town council's role, certainly. Um, so I'll try to concentrate on that, uh, land use issues and questions. But I'll be studying up on, you know, what my uh, confines are as it relates to contract zone. And what I'd like to see in your next submission is, and maybe you're, it's going to be an automatic, but I just want to make sure that uh, I'm looking at what is existing, what's already been approved, to, you know, re-familiarize myself with the process that went into approving Piper Shores in, in the first place, and then it helps me to compare what you're proposing today, to add to that. Um, right away, uh, Nothing really pops off the uh, the page for me as, as major concerns. Um, you say that you're going to modify the um, retention pond. Correct. Uh, can you be more specific, or <coughs> are you able to right now? Or? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the pond was uh, designed uh, to meet DEP standards in 1997, and it, it was it was a different standard. Um, it was designed to uh, remove pollutants as associated with suspended solids uh, and, and really just the sizing and sizing criteria was a little different and uh, really the design standards were a little different. Well, going back today and uh, to DEP and seeking approval of the revised plan requires that we uh, we treat any of this redevelopment, any, any runoff from the redeveloped areas needs to be treated to today's standards not to the standards in place in 1997. So to do that, we're going to, uh, we're going to bring the existing pond up to today's standards, and, and really that involves modifying the, the outlet of the pond rather than just flowing uh, through a 24-inch a culvert out of the pond. Uh, runoff will it'll drain through a, a gravel bench, so it'll be filtered through like a gravel material before outletting to, to where it outlets today, which is just sort of to the north. So would you say that the impact from the revised stormwater retention pond will be less the same or potentially a little bit more than what is currently experienced? Uh, I, th I think it'll be, it'll be a little different. <laughs> Again, different. I think that there will, be, uh, there will be an increase in runoff to the pond just because of the uh, we're going to increase the impervious area by a small amount, and the tributary area will increase a little bit too. Um, but to accommodate that, we'll we'll be modifying the the pond outlet, uh, not only the gravel bench that I mentioned before, but there's also an outlet control structure that sort of controls the release rate uh, of runoff out of the pond. So we'll be, we'll modify that, potentially be modifying that too, to to make sure uh, rates of runoff aren't increased. So so you're not sort of sending a greater rate of runoff downstream than, than exists today. Um, so I, I, obviously I'm interested in that, that piece at this point in time because um, not, not being an engineer certainly, but I would, I would use a different term to describe the, um, I, I, it looks to me to be a significant amount of additional impervious service that's being introduced. And with that, I'm concerned about how that's going to behave, how that stormwater retention pond is going to behave and its impact to neighboring property, that's all. Sure. So um, anything you can do to help 
simple guy like me understand that the impact will be, you know, the same or less would would really be uh, something I'd like like to read about. That's great. Right. Um, the garden area uh, doesn't seem to me, you know, and it, it's hard to really grasp it from this perspective and the scale, but it just doesn't seem to me to be ideal. Um, if uh, if I was to guess, I would almost hear that everything was designed, and then we said, oh, wait a minute, where are we going to put the garden area? So um, with parking all around it, potential for uh, pedestrians, you know, having to navigate through traffic, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping maybe you can come up with some um, fresh ideas for that, even if it's the same location, how to just alleviate any concerns. Sure. Um, as far as vehicles entering and exiting the site, <clears throat> this will probably get reviewed. Uh, this is for staff, probably by our fire department, et cetera, maybe, to ensure that it uh, maintains its current standard for the fire department will emergency response. certainly look at um, the addition in terms of emergency response and access to sides of the building, yeah. that kind of thing. Because, <laughs> because when I see it right now, I see that, you know, it's a long way from, <coughs> if I can use the perspective that I'm looking at now from the right side of the current building to get out. You know, you got to go all the way back out and, you know, maybe maybe it's just really nothing, but it just seems like it's, it's a lot, it'll be a lot uh, uh, more difficult to um, exit in the, in the case of a uh, significant emergency than it might be today. So if you can just speak to that in, the, in future meetings, that would be helpful also. Sure, yeah. Uh, how, how many new parking spaces over what exists today? Did you speak to that? <clears throat> uh, I did. I don't have an exact number for you right now, and, and the reason is uh, we're still working to configure parking under the building, so column locations and wall locations, uh, as you can imagine, sort of affect those numbers. But uh, again, we're, we're shooting for uh, we're shooting for an increase in parking, and we're working on sort of a, a, an overall analysis of parking needs for the facility, uh, and, and we'll provide that as, as backup for, for the proposal we come forward with. Okay. Well, that's all I have for now. I appreciate uh, you um, um, considering those concerns I have, and I uh, look forward to the next time that you return. Thanks. Continue the dialogue. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'd like to start off by amplifying, uh, I think this is the first thing that Mr. Wood said, which is that it would be really helpful with the next submission to have um, to have all the pieces here clearly <coughs> identified and highlighted in terms of sort of what was, what's existing, what was originally approved, what you're proposing. Um, you know, there's some of us who have seen this in one capacity or another over the years. Others who, um, well, this will be the, their first time seeing it since joining the board. There's always turnover, and I think given that there's clearly been a little bit of confusion, at least among some in the public, about sort of what's actually being proposed here and how this relates to what's been discussed at various points, I think it would be helpful <coughs> in that sense, but also more specifically for the board, it would be helpful to to have those things clearly delineated. I know looking at the, the plan that we got, it was very difficult for me to um, distinguish or to really tell where the where the building outlines were and sort of what was existing versus proposed. And again, sure. I, obviously this is a preliminary step, but that would be really helpful. Um, also along those lines, it would be helpful for me and I would assume for the rest of the board if you could clearly indicate sort of the, the proposed traffic circulation pattern, including where you're going under things um, and maybe highlight where delivery areas are and, and things like that. Uh, I think it's pretty clear from the discussion tonight that that's going to be a big focus area uh, going forward. Um, and obviously, as has been discussed, we'll want to see more specifics on what you're proposing for parking, um, pedestrian safety uh, as well related to that. And on that note, I would agree with Mr. Wood that um, there are some potential concerns with having the community garden out in the sort of on an island surrounded by parking. I, I <coughs> certainly see that on the one hand it's centrally located within the complex, so that would be a plus, but um, 
I would be concerned about safety and, and maybe there's a way to address that. Uh, so I'll look forward to seeing more on that next time. And of course, as has been mentioned, um, we'll be paying close attention as always to architecture with relation to the design standards um, and all the usual sort of coordination with the fire department and other things that you do at, at this stage. One question I have around the arts building, is it, um, is that contemplated as sort of being a, um, basically a place where people go and do arts and crafts or, or will there ever be sort of performances there or anything along those lines or is it more of a arts yeah. and crafts? Yeah, <coughs> perhaps Jim could speak a little more to it. I, I know there are, uh, this, at this stage I know there are rooms that will be dedicated to sort of painting and mm -hmm. perhaps ceramics and, and that sort of thing as far as performances or... The reason I ask is that, as you probably guess, is related to, to parking and yeah. whether it might be necessary or, or advisable to have something there that's for visitors who might be coming to the extent that there are exhibits or anything like sure. that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get a, a concrete answer for you and, and look okay. at parking in, in that light uh, before we come back to you. Okay. Uh, beyond that, I don't think I have anything else that hasn't already been mentioned. Uh, just for the record, uh, and Mr. Mazur alluded to this email that we received uh, from uh, Susan Thompson and Patricia Butner, dated uh, February 27, 2015. We, we all received a copy of that, and that will be added to the record. And again, we anticipate that we'll have public comment available uh, the next time this item's in front of us. And uh, aside from that, I think that's all we've got. Are there any, do you have any questions for us or any feedback? that we haven't provided that you could use? I don't. I think it's been great. I appreciate all the feedback you've given us. Okay. Thanks Thank very you. much. Look forward to seeing it. <laughs> Item number eight. Rosbera Brothers Construction Company requests a sketch plan review for a proposed amendment to the Thiburge, apologies if I'm mispronouncing that, <laughs> subdivision for the addition of seven new residential lots. Dan? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Memory Lane is an existing public street and it's an existing neighborhood and this proposal um, proposed to extend a, a road <coughs> and create seven more house lots off of the end of Memory Lane. Um, it's a conservation subdivision design but it's a, a bit unique um, in that the, uh, the lots are full R2 size lots typically on a conservation subdivision design because of the open space protected, 50% uh, the lots become 50% smaller. In this case, um, given the lack of sewer um, out here and the maybe the amount of wetlands, um, the lots are full R2 lots. Though I think at least 50% or greater is going to be open space. Um, unfortunately, a neighboring subdivision is not enabling um, sewer. Uh, a project from from years ago. Um, with a dead end road approved and unfortunately um, there was a strip that was retained by uh, the homeowner association that sort of prevents interconnectivity of both the sewer line and uh, water line or uh, as well as the roadway. Um, so to the board's workshop earlier today and the importance of connectivity, I think this is an example of um, a failure of connectivity um, in the past and sort of it's impacting you know, this project and the in inability to at least have a, a sewer line and be served by sewer rather than on-site wastewater and, and maybe have a road or uh, pedestrian connect connection. Um, to that end, uh, in the staff review meeting, there was some discussion about maybe still enabling uh, an easement from this um, dead end road over to the Bonnie Grove um, dead end in the instance that attitudes change about a sewer connection. Um, this area of town, there is, there's some adjacent neighborhoods that don't have good soils and therefore don't have good septic systems. I'm not suggesting that that necessarily is going to happen here, but at least maybe enabling future sewer connection if there's a problem might be something the board could consider with the applicant. Um, and other than that, um, obviously, this is extending an existing neighborhood street, so giving a thought to how to make this subdivision look part of the existing neighborhood and, and 
um, be sort of compatible with the neighborhood. Uh, things that could help with that might be removing the existing turnaround that's on the existing end of memory lane. Um, you know, looking at buffers to to neighboring established uh, home sites. Um, and I think the lot sizes are comparable, so that can help with kind of having this second phase fit in with the existing neighborhood. So, but giving some thought to that. I think would be would be beneficial. So with that introduction, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, and I'll turn it over to you, Nancy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Nancy St. Clair, St. Clair <coughs> Associates. Tonight in the audience, I have Rocky Risbera with me, Risbera Brothers Construction. I also have my husband, David, there with me as well. Uh, we're here tonight to talk to you about the second amendment to the Suburge subdivision. This is a subdivision that was actually uh, created back in 2002. Uh, at the time, it created eight lots. We're specifically looking at lot number eight. It is the largest remaining lot. It was set aside uh, as an area reserved for future development. It is at the end of Memory Lane, as you see on the plan. Memory Lane extends in off of to Rod Road on the what would be the <coughs> sort of westerly side of this property is the main turnpike. On what would be the easterly side of the property is the Bonnie Grove subdivision, and that is the subdivision that Dan had mentioned uh, with regard to the fact that Bonnie Grove Drive, as you see it on the plan here, I'll show it to you right there in that location there, uh, terminates in a hammerhead. Uh, there is a piece of property in between the end of the public street uh, and our property uh, that is actually part of the open space for that subdivision. So there's a bit of a gap there. Uh, in the uh, connectivity with that piece of property. Uh, as we mentioned, we are proposing to extend Memory Lane. Memory Lane right now ends in a hammerhead. When the original subdivision was designed, the hammerhead was designed as a temporary turnaround uh, with the thought that the road would eventually extend uh, out into the property. Uh, as Dan had alluded, uh, the sizes of the lots are comparable to the lot sizes in the existing subdivision. However, based on the current ordinance criteria, we are required to do a conservation subdivision. But the space and bulk criteria, because we are on subsurface disposal systems, is no different than a traditional uh, R2 residential development. So we have lot sizes that are comparable. Uh, we do have a large area that's set aside in open space. The entire parcel is about 17.8 acres in size and about 55% of that uh, is set aside as open space. And that is on this edge right here and all the way up to the end of the property. You receive two drawings in your packet. One is sort of an overview that shows how far the property does extend up. Uh, and then you see a more close-up view, which is represented here on the rendering. Uh, that focuses in on the area that would be uh, developed for the, the proposed seven new lots. There are seven existing homes on memory lane right now, so we would be providing seven new homes uh, on the property. We are proposing uh, to terminate uh, memory lane extension in the Hammerhead as well. Uh, so design-wise, we envision that this would be seamless for the existing road. Uh, t the same type of a design would be continued uh, throughout our new uh, phase of the project. With regard to consistency in the neighborhood, uh, the applicant did not develop this subdivision, but they actually did build a number of the homes in it. Uh, so from a continuity standpoint, we feel that we can, we can do well to blend in with the existing neighborhood uh, on that. As Dan mentioned, the applicant did reach out to the uh, Homeowners Association on Bonnie Grove to talk to them about two different items. One was connectivity with the roadway on Bonnie Grove, and the other was to connect into the existing municipal sewer that is in the street uh, in Bonnie Grove Drive. Uh, we received a letter which we provided to uh, the planning office, which indicates that the Homeowners Associ Association did uh, have a meeting. They did discuss both requests and uh, unanimously voted not to authorize either connection. So uh, we are moving forward with a program that does have subsurface disposal systems for the lots. We are on public water. There is a public water main uh, in memory lane, and we would be proposing to extend that up. Uh, so the, the lots would have public water but private sewer. And as sort of the next steps in the process, if you will, 
Uh, we'll be providing additional uh, soils information on the site. We've done some initial work uh, with the snow cover right now. We haven't been able to complete that, uh, but we will be providing that updated information as part of a formal application package for you. If you look at the plan, you'll see that there is a fair amount of wetlands that are associated with the uh, end of Memory Lane as it exists right now. Uh, we would be proposing to cross that wetland area to come up into the upland uh, area within the site. <coughs> and those uplands are uh, actually a nice buffer between the new homes and the existing homes that are on the end of Memory Lane. So we're proposing to uh, place our new homes in an area that is predominantly upland, and then on the sort of upper end of the site, the open space area uh, is uh, going to be set aside with some wetlands up in that area as well. You'll note in our application materials, we noted the fact that uh, the wetland delineation sort of goes to this, this point right in this area here. Our delineation has assumed that the remainder of the property is predominantly wet, but we do not know that at this point. Um, our calculations for density have assumed that everything in that area would come out uh, from a density calculation. The original density calculations for the subdivision indicated that there was a large number of lots that could be uh, further developed in the subdivision. Uh, when we first met with staff, they also asked us to take a look at the current density criteria and to look at this lot specifically independent on its own. Uh, those density calculations were provided to you as part of your application. Those indicate that uh, up to nine lots could be provided on this uh, individual lot on lot eight of the original subdivision. We are proposing seven. Uh, so as part of that, we'd like to get your initial feedback uh, on the program and uh, look forward to any comments. Thank you. Nick, would you like to start? Uh, sure. I just want to be clear. The, is that a lot at the end of Bonnie Grove? Like this right here is a lot that's part of the subdivision. The access would come up along here and up in, and a house would sit in that area there. So you have a, <clears throat> a driveway along? I think I'm missing a property line, or it's yeah. hidden under other things on my, my paperwork. Driveway along here. So is that whole thing, that whole thing's this, one big lot is what you're this saying? This is one large lot. Gotcha. Right there. Okay. Nice. So I guess that's actually like two acres according to this, is that correct? Yeah, I think one of the things to, to point out is this is a 30 scale rendering. Mm -hmm. A lot of the subdivisions that we present to you are at a much uh, different scale. So what seems to be quite large is actually at 30 scale more of a reasonable size for that. Right, that's that's only two acres, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're going to be able to get a driveway in avoiding the wetlands? We yeah. anticipate, we do have a crossing right there that we've identified. We would bring the wetlands in up along this line and then come up in and put the, the house right in that area there. Okay. And so the, at the so that bottom, the first one on the left as you come in, that is another huge, yep, huge, in, on the drawing, huge. Yes, yep, lot. that house would sit right in here. And that's, okay, so that that is where they could sit. Okay. And that's. And if you, if you want to do a, a bit of a comparison there. If you look at this lot here, this is one of the existing lots in the subdivision. Right. So if you look for comparison, sort of the the window for that is a comparable size for that. It's just okay. at the the lot area. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just um, I didn't know if I was missing a line, and oh, I didn't realize no. it had gone all the way around. <laughs> but thank you. Um, so I see the eight now. All right, I'm sorry, seven, seven lots. Um, what's the second up that hammerhead? What above the hammerhead? What is that little kind of? This right here? Yes, that. Um, with a hammerhead, mm -hmm. there has been a fair amount of staff detailed review as to, through coordination with the various departments, including Public Works, uh, uh, discussion as to when you do build a hammerhead, where are <coughs> the appropriate and satisfactory locations for a driveway that meet the plowing requirements for Public Street, that type of thing. So that little stub, if you will, right there, mm -hmm. identifies on that particular lot where the driveway would need to be. The other lots have the flexibility. It's just that when you're dealing with the hammerhead, um, we don't want to have access off the hammerhead itself, and we don't want to have it either too close to here or too close to the end. So 
that's sort of the demarcation point that uh, has been worked out through staff review of a number of Hammerhead uh, designs lately. Okay. Um, I think, you know, from what I'm seeing, you've been very, very creative at trying to avoid wetlands on the properties. Um, it appears, though, that there are still some areas and private, some private lots that might have some wetlands on it, and I don't know if that's possible to clean up. Um, if, you, if you look at the back of lot 8, 2, <coughs> uh, number 2, I guess, lot 2. Yeah, I think that back corner's got a little bit of wetlands, but you, you've been through this before. Um, if there's a way to clean it up a little, that's, I think that'd be preferable. Um, I don't see anything egregious, though, so that's the other thing to keep in mind. What we looked at doing was uh, this area here. There's that 25-foot um, upland buffer that mm -hmm. protects the, the area, the open space. So we've got the open space. We've got a 25-foot upland buffer that provides the demarcation line with the lots in the subdivision in the open space that, that would be the formal open space. Uh, in the areas along here, these are not physically connected to this open space, so they are just simply in the backs of the lots. I think um, for right now, I'm okay. Something else might pop up right now. Thank you. Yeah, in front of the lots, um, one, two, three, and four, the dark green, is that what one? Well, Rocky actually got after me about that because oh. when I colored this on the screen, it, it was a very different color and it was easy to ah, see. But so it's it doesn't wrong. present well. I apologize for that. The darker green that's right here is and actually the, the front yard setback. And then the other side as well? Same thing. So we're not crossing so wetlands to get to the So we've got, there's a wetland crossing right there. Yep. There's a wetland crossing right, right there. there. And it. then these are the wetlands here. And then this area here is all upland. Mm-hmm. And then we have the wetlands back well, here. Well, Rocky was right. I know, he usually is, but in this case, he really was right. It was <laughs> Next time, it needs to be colored differently, because I was going to say, oh, my, look at all those wetlands we're co co crossing, but okay. Um, I was out there the other day. By the way, I hope the weather gets better soon so we can have sight walks. <laughs> They're really so incredibly helpful. So I drive daily down uh, memory lane, and the road starts to do this. And then there's the hammerhead, and I'm looking, and I'm saying, oh, the road is going to disappear <laughs> down into a, quite a deep gully, yes? There, am I right, down to those wetlands? Is it's a fairly... There's, right in this area here, the road does drop down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But after that, it doesn't drop down when you hit into the new land? Well, it ends right here, and so what we would be doing is tying into that grade, and then we would look... We don't want to have the road too high because we don't want to have an, an wide for Phil. So he says he could do anything with dirt. <laughs> so I'm sh I'll never. I'll have that on the back of my gravestone, I think. Um, so but we would look at the profile of the road uh, yes, as part of that. The road. I don't envision that that section of the road is going to be tremendously higher than the surrounding grade okay. because we do want to limit the wetland fill at the crossing. Well, that's what I'm getting at. And thank so you for knowing that's where I was going. You know, I mean, it's got enough things happening that even though you're all very aware of it, this is going to be, I think, perhaps a tad fussier than some of the others. I'm a wetland preser preservationist, you know, and so this is going to be watched closely by me and all of us, of course, but you folks can do it if anybody can do it. I think it's a shame that we can't hook in. Somebody has to say it, so we blew it. And uh, let's make sure we don't ever blow it again <laughs> in terms of that interconnectivity to the, to the sewer system. That's really too bad that it has to work out that way. But that's just the way it goes. So I guess that's all I have at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Mike? Mm, thank you. I don't have much to add, really. Um, I, I am uh, curious, uh, of course, this is your business, Nancy, not mine, but I am curious as to uh, the great pains at least it appears, what will be great pains to reach lot 87 with a driveway. Um, but um, whatever, you know the market, and you know the topography, and you know the alternatives, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer cul-de-sacs, but um, I understand some of the reasons why one other, uh, others may not. Um, 
On the uh, Stewart Road, I know that uh, horse has left the barn, but I'm just curious. Uh, the letter from Bonnie Grove spoke to both conditions, extending the road and the sewer as being inseparable. Yet, it seems to me some of the language coming from others where it was either or or both, which is right. To my knowledge, the way I read and interpreted that letter, that they voted on both of the two items and declined on both of them. So it wasn't a, we have to do both. Uh, and I believe that Rocky asked either or. So. Oh, either or, okay. So so they, they couldn't even see, um, now that's a public sewer that serves Pawnee Grove, right? That is correct. Okay. But they, uh, they weren't interested in allowing that effluent to flow underneath that precious buffer. No. <clears throat> Okay, it's too bad. I mean, I can understand extending the road. I certainly understand that. But I don't understand the uh, the reluctance for the sewer because mm -hmm. I think in the, in the in a bigger bigger picture, I think land that is served by sewer is probably you know maintained in a more healthier manner than those that are maintained by subsurface sewage systems. So it doesn't make any sense to me why you would say no to that. Maybe. Um, my colleague answered the questions about the baby hammerhead. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can see where you're crossing the wetlands, and um, I can see that you've uh, you made a lot of effort to navigate around that which remains. So I don't have a lot of concerns. And uh, would you guess at what the you don't have elevations on this? Am I missing it? No, we do not. Uh, so just to piggyback off what Sue was saying, just so I can get a sense, I haven't had a chance to drive out there yet. What what is the, uh, the the difference in grade from the end of Memory Lane and and say uh, 50 feet up to the new property? I would say that you are probably looking on the order of about 100 feet is where the 100 feet back from where the end of Memory Lane is, is where the grade begins to change, and it looks from that topography we're about a six foot grade change coming down through in that section. Um, before we sort of drop off into the rest of the site. So we would be coming up with our road to tie into that elevation, yeah. but we're not going to be higher or coming back uphill. Okay. Very good. Well, maybe somebody's watching tonight. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll uh, make a phone call and change <laughs> their mind. <laughs> you know, the other thing is, is that I would imagine, now I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you can tell me otherwise, certainly, if sewer was allowed to be connected to Bonnie Grove, Nothing else, no road, just sewer. And the landscape, you know, uh, 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 reclaimed and put back together. Would that lot be different? Would that house maybe not be there? I mean... You would see a different layout. You would. You, you would you, see a different you layout. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how these folks voted, certainly. I think it was unanimous. But um, it was, yeah. seems to me, if I was at the end of Bonnie Grove, I'd be interested in hearing that. Well, you weren't. <laughs> Whatever. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> you weren't there. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll just piggyback on that briefly and add my voice to that. It's obviously unfortunate. Do um, I have a say? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Tonight only. <laughs> um, he knows better. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to echo what my fellow board members. I, I, it blows my mind. Uh, about the voting unanimous, uh, and I and I m my gut tells me because I don't know this factually that it was a, a gut reaction NIMBY, not in my backyard type of, uh, of vote, and uh, it's too bad. And I agree with Susan that uh, uh, we not as a board allow this to happen going forward. That we have the uh, uh, foresight to uh, build this into future projects, but in light of that. I, meant, I heard Dan say that the soil there is not the best soil in the area. And how is that going to impact uh, the implementation of septic systems if there's no connection? As part of our application materials that we'll be filing with you folks, each one of these lots will be required to have a passing test pit that will meet the state standards and be able to support a subsurface disposal design individually uh, within each lot. So that's part of that field work that we'll be doing once the snow goes. Uh, as I mentioned, we've done some initial work uh, back in the fall, but additional work needs to be done 
in order to be able to demonstrate to you. You'll see on the plan there are a few locations where there are already uh, some test pits shown uh, on the plan, but each one of the lots will have its own uh, as part of that. But based on the current soil, and I know you may not know the answer to this, this may add an additional expense because there might have to be certain soils brought in to come up to standard. Is that correct? Can I address that? <coughs> sure. Rocky Risperra. <coughs> Um Nancy was wrong. We don't have to meet the state standards. We have to meet the town of Scarborough standards. Right. Scarborough's got the toughest ordinance in the state. I know. I've gone so, through it personally. Um, our, you know, so our soils review is is meeting is a, is a higher review than than the state standards. So, um, Dan's right. There are you know tough soils in the area. There's a project that was done back in the early 70s that is known. You know, there's septic system failures over there. Um, that was done before Scarborough changed its ordinance. So I, I have no fear that the soils that, you know, the good soils that we find will support proper septic systems for these houses. What I can't tell you tonight is that we have a passing test pit for every single lot we've got drawn. I think we do, but I'm not sure. And we got clipped by the weather this year and, and just couldn't, couldn't get it done. So as soon as the weather, you know, is cooperative, we'll be out there and, and we either have good soils or, or we don't. So if we have good soils, the septic systems will will work. So I guess my only point, Marco, is the, is the fact that it's too bad that the connection can't be made because potentially it's going to add an additional expense that doesn't necessarily have to be there if there was an agreement. I I understand and agree. Thank you. Um, that, that's I also, all I was, that's I also I know talking. why it's there. I mean, uh, if I had done Bonnie Grove, I probably would have done something similar. Yeah. And that's as a developer, I've built a long road. I don't want to give the next guy access for nothing. So as a board, you're going to struggle with that. Uh, as you, you know, I'm, I'm hearing, oh, gee, we shouldn't let that happen again. But it, it's going to be something to talk about as it, as it occurs again right. um, be, because of that fact. Um, I did approach them. I sent them a detailed letter asking ask for access, asking for sewer, asking for both, asking for one or the other. Whatever I could get, really hoping that I, you know, we could get the sewer. I thought that was really pretty, uh, you know, should have been pretty easy to do. But they're not interested in, in cooperating. And I'm, I heard from the landowner actually today that they had approached them a couple of years ago, and and they weren't interested then either. So uh, I think the answer has been consistent. But maybe somebody sees this meeting on TV, and maybe I get a call this week. Who knows? Thank you. That's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Foiled in my attempt to silence you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, that obviously is unfortunate. Uh, that the uh, lack of cooperation from the abutting homeowners association. I mean, I suspect it's something as simple as, as what's in it for them. There's really no upside to someone who's got an existing dead end neighborhood there. So it is what it is, and uh, hopefully that can be um, that sort of thing can be avoided in the future. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add. I, I guess I generally agree with the comment that um, you know, we obviously want to, as always, try to minimize wetlands on pro property, and um, presumably future versions of the plan will be a little bit easier to read in terms of seeing what's upland versus wetland and where the property lines are within that, and then uh, also seeing the, the topography so we have a, a better sense of grade, because uh, as Susan indicated, it's Particularly difficult right now when we—it's difficult to get a lay of the land, literally, uh, right now, about the snow cover and everything. So, um, look forward to, to seeing that in more detail. Um, one question: Has there been outreach to the existing homeowners on Memory Lane, and then more specifically, uh, <coughs> the owners of the property that have the existing hammerhead, and the notion of potentially uh, removing that at some point? Rocky and I talked about that. I don't think it's happened yet, or has it? Um, outreach to existing neighbors on memory lane, no, not really. I haven't spoken with anybody. I did send uh, a letter and an email to uh, Brian Shumway, who owns the lot that the turnaround is on, and he and I are going to speak. He did speak it back to me this weekend and said, let's just catch up. So okay. um, the, and the note on the, on the existing plan is clear that we're supposed to remove it. If he tells me he doesn't want it removed, I guess I'm going to come and ask the board to, to leave it. But uh, we'll, we'll see what he has to say. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, again, as is often the case with these 
conservation subdivisions, even though this is a little bit of a hybrid, you know, there seems like there's always one or two lots where we scratch our heads and say, are you going to get to that? But um, as Mike said, uh, you know what you're doing, and we'll look forward to seeing how you how you do it. How you do it. Um, <laughs> and um, beyond that, I don't think I really have anything else. Is there? Do you have any anything you'd like to hear from us? I guess the only other the thing I, I wanted to know, and I did put it in the cover letter, one of the things that we would be asking of the board uh, is that as part of our sort of preliminary review, because we're on public water, uh, we'd ask that there be a waiver on the requirement of a nitrate impact study uh, for the subsurface disposal system. So um, that is a waiver that we would be seeking when we do come back and file our formal application materials. I just wanted to let you folks know. I'm seeing a couple of nods. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Can I speak to that? Sure. Um, I, I think, Nancy, um, I personally, and, and if my colleagues don't agree, then, you know, um, and I'm a lone voice. And, uh, but I might be interested in at least seeing the nitrate impact study as it relates to any property that abuts to another another currently owned, you know. I mean, does it impact Bonnie Grove? Will that nitrate study impact there, or will it impact the existing lots on Bonnie Grove, I, I think it's part of me that thinks that that's only right to do. Um, just, uh, we'll certainly provide more information as we go forward, but just sort of uh, initially looking at things, I think there's a, a sizable area of uh, existing wetlands that are sort of in between all those, and the way that sort of the landform goes, that it's probably not an issue. Okay. Um, but we would follow up on that. Mm -hmm. And to that point, you could do an inventory of what properties are served by on-site well to to kind of gauge oh, right. concerns. That's a good idea. That, yeah, that would be, that would be, even more, that would be more targeted to what mm -hmm. I'm really yeah. talking about. So thank you. I think that's a good, good suggestion. Thank Anything you. else on that? All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. See you next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nancy. Moving on, is there a town planner's report? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Why not? Not just the yes or no question. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to make the board aware that um, coming up on March 25th, which is a Wednesday, I think it's the last Wednesday of the month, um, Public Works and the Planning Department and the Cumberland County Soil and Water Conservation Group are hoping to do... Um, a stormwater focus workshop, um, but to talk about things other than just stormwater to hopefully get some attendance. <laughs> so we um, we talked about kind of tying stormwater to some of you know Scarborough's assets, you know the marsh, um, streams, our beaches, and also economic development development review that the planning board is obviously front front and center on. You know how stormwater interrelates to the environment, but also to uh, the development community and, and, and growth and growth management in town. So um, we hope to have it be a bit diverse and not just talking about stormwater ponds and um, kind of the technical aspects, but really the importance of taking care of uh, runoff in the community and, and how that relates to the broader public and a variety of different boards. So. We're hoping that planning board members can attend, um, but we also, you know, hope to open it up to SEDCO, much like this evening's workshop, a, a range of committees that touch the the subject matter from one angle or another. So, when? When? Um, Wednesday, March 25th, yep. and we're it would be here at Town Hall, and we're thinking 6:30 or 7. We'll send out a formal invitation in the next few days. Um, and we're setting in a sort of the outline of the presentation tomorrow. So Thank you. I want to give you a quick heads up on that. That's about two weeks out, um, and more to follow on that. Um, I think the other item of note that um, was relevant today is Karen and I spent the morning at the State House um, in Augusta speaking in favor of uh, a bill that uh, Senator Volk has sponsored that relates to this board and that um, I think as most board members know we last spring got municipal capacity for 
uh, site location and development um, after a lot of review with DEP and that <coughs> gives Scarborough and this board the ability to review larger development projects without needing to go, applicants needing to go to the state DEP for that review. Right. They still need to go for stormwater and other things. Um, one of the aspects of that, the current law on that is that projects that have existing site law permits in place that want to amend them or modify them under how the law reads now still need to go back to DEP, um, even though the, the town has been deemed to have the capacity to review new projects, and typically new projects are bigger and more kind of complex than amendments. Um, so that's what's proposed, is to change that law so that towns that have municipal capacity also have the ability to re review modifications to past projects approved by DEP. Um, so we presented that today, and I think we'll continue to monitor that, um, but that's something that hopefully would enable the town to, to handle all site law projects, whether they're new or modifications. Um, so those are two a few guys. current events, and um, that's what I have for you. Thanks, Tim. Administrative Amendment Report. It's my understanding that Corey, you, and um, Jay worked together to administratively approve the addition of a storage shed at the Prouts Neck Country Club on Ferry Road. I think that was the yes, we did. action since so your last meeting. So with, with? Uh, the Prouts Neck Country Club added a <coughs> storage shed on Ferry Road on the way to Ferry Beach. Um, so that was administratively approved in the last two weeks. Thank you. Any planning board correspondence beyond the email that we mentioned in connection with one of the proposals? No? Planning board comments? Yeah. Uh, had a meeting, Transportation Committee, on 224. And again, the focus has been on the reconfiguration of the flow of traffic in both uh, automobile and pedestrian and in the Oak Hill area. And we're still struggling with some suggestions of how to do that. This is, it's, it's very difficult to come up with something that's going to be suitable for all entities uh, involved. Uh, well, we've got some ideas, but one of the things that's going to happen immediately is the lights are going to be reconfigured to make the flow of traffic go. And that'll help everybody. It'll help pedestrians and getting across and it'll help uh, the flow of traffic, too. So that's going to happen immediately. The rest of it, we're still working on two or three options, and uh, I'll keep the board informed. And based on uh, tonight's uh, workshop, we'll, um, we'll make a recommendation that we now also focus on the Dunstan area in addition to this area. So that's with the Transportation Committee. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, and I think it would be great, to, uh, as you mentioned earlier and during the workshop, to, to have the committee turn its attention to the extent there's bandwidth there to, to Dunstan Corner. And I thought it was a uh, an interesting uh, workshop earlier this evening, and I thank the planning staff and SEDCO for helping to put that on. And, Agreed. Uh, it's been interesting to watch it unfold, um, sort of see the, the planning and infrastructure investment dovetail with some of the market forces and some of the things that are actually happening down there. So thanks again for that. Nice crowd, by the way. I was very it was impressed. A, very a nice. A diverse crowd. crowd. Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, um, yes. so, should we keep um, our materials for items five and six that were tabled? or Yes. Will it be? Okay. Yeah. So it won't be materially different. If there are updates, we'll provide them. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I will move to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you.